All right, folks, can y'all hear me okay? Yeah, all good. All right, cool. Um, let's see here. All right. Hopefully, y'all got an uh, announcement in the email that I was incorrect last time. Exam number one is not optional. All right, you have to take it. Okay. I was looking here at the exams. The retries over here are optional. Okay. But the exam one through four, you have to take it. Now, exam one is outside of class, the rest will be in class. All right. And you want to make sure you take your exams because taking the retry sucks because it's complicated. Remember from the syllabus, uh, in order to be able to take the retry, first you have to do your exam uh, corrections. Then you have to take that to the math gym, have them check it, uh, uh, verify it, then upload it. And then you can take the retry. And if you do the retry, at most you can earn back half the points that you missed on the the original test. It's a complicated process. It's doable, but it's a complicated process, right? So try to do well on the initial exam, okay? Uh, so you don't have to do uh, the retry, okay? Um, so uh, remind me to say this again at the end of class, all right? I don't want, I don't want people missing exam one and having to do the retry. So today we're going to finish 5.1 and then start 5.2. Uh, here's 5.1. So here is sample six. So show the angle with measure negative 45 degrees on a circle. OK, a negative angle goes this way. So there's negative 45 degrees. Now find a positive coterminal co angle alpha, where alpha is between zero and 360. They're wanting, what they're wanting is this angle, right? They have the same initial side, and they have the same terminal side, hence the term coterminal. Now, if all the way around is 360, if we're going to stop 45 degrees short of 360, that would be 315 degrees. That's our alpha, OK? Um, so let's try it number six. Okay, so find an angle beta that is coterminal with an angle measuring negative 300 degrees. Well, since it's negative, we're going this way. All the way around would be 360. So we want to be 60 degrees short. So this is negative 300 degrees. We want beta to be between zero and 360. So what we're talking about here is 60 degrees, right? These are coterminal. They have the same ending ray. They all begin there. They both begin there, and they both end here, OK? So beta is 60 degrees. 60 is between 0 and 360, OK? I don't know if y'all can hear my dog snoring behind me. Uh, look at another one. So this one here is in radians instead of uh, degrees. Fine. Okay. We want to angle coterminal with 19 pi over 4. Okay. Well, um, remember this is pi, right? So each one of these is a pi over 4. So the way I would do this is I'd be like, OK, 4 pi over 4, 8 pi over 4, 12 pi over 4, 16 pi over 4, 17, 18, 19. That's 19 pi over 4. OK, now look at it this way. 19 pi over 4 is the same as 16 pi plus 3 pi over 4. This is just 4 pi, and then we have 3 pi over 4. So we're just going around the circle twice, and then another 3 pi over 4. All right. Uh, they want an angle that's between 0 and 2 pi, somewhere between here and here. 
that's coterminal. Well, how about just this? Oop, three pi over four. That's our beta. Okay, they're coterminal. They both end here. Okay, I'll do that in green. Their terminal ray is the same, hence co. Okay. Um, well, here's another one. I think I. Okay, um, find an angle theta that is coterminal with negative 17 pi over six. Okay, so uh, pi is over six. Well, from here to here is pi, so it's going to take six pi over six to go halfway around. Now we're going negative, right? So here's a negative six pi over six. This would be a negative 12 pi over six. All right. Uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Oop. So that's negative 17 pi over six. Okay. So that makes this little thing here a pi over six. So this angle would be six pi over six, seven pi over six. All right, that's our theta. That's the coterminal angle. And you can think about it this way, like uh, negative 17 pi over 6. This is negative 12 pi over 6, right? And then another negative 5 pi over 6, right? So this is just negative 2 pi and then another 5 pi over 6. So this part is just the going around once and then another five pi over six. When I think about five pi over six, I'm really thinking pi over six short of six pi over six, right? That's why that's a pi over six there, okay? That's how I would think about it. So our theta here is gonna be seven pi over six, six pi over six, and another pi over six, which is seven pi over six. All right, uh, arc length. So I've discussed all this stuff in the last class briefly, right? But now we're gonna go through it all in detail and work examples, right? Uh, remember, I gave you a definition. Theta, by definition, was S over R. This was what an angle is in radians. So that's something you have to memorize. You have to memorize definitions. There's no way around it. But if we multiply both sides by R, we have S equals R theta. That tells us the arc length, right? Here's S the arc length subtended by the angle theta, okay? So that's important. We're gonna use that to do a lot of stuff here. Now this example is worded really awkwardly, okay? But we're gonna make some sense out of it here. All right, uh, orbit of Mercury around the sun, assume it's a perfect circle, all right? Perfect circle, it's perfect to me, right? All right, the, it's 36 million miles from the sun. So this dot here, here's the sun. Here's our R. R is 36 million miles, okay? So in one Earth day, that's 24 of our hours, Mercury completes 0.0114 of its total revolution. This sentence here is, this, unless you, taking a lot of math, that's just an awkward sounding sentence. Like, what does that mean? What they're, they're saying here is 1.14%, uh, all right? Remember the percent symbol is just shortcut for saying over 100, all right? So, and if you divide by 100, that's what they're meaning here. They're, they mean 1.14% of its total revolution, okay? So, how many miles did it travel in one Earth day? Well, uh, it travels that far, 1.14% of its total revolution. Well, a total revolution is the circumference of a circle, right? So a total revolution here is two pi times 36 million miles. That's all the way around, right? But we wanna know what is 1.14% of that? So the distance it's traveled 
would be 1.14% of the circumference. This in a percentage is just 0.0114 and the circumference is this a length, right? Okay. And this is a number, 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 number. This is just some huge ass number of miles. That's how you do this problem, okay? We find out the distance all the way around, and then we take 1.14% of it. That's how far it's traveled in one Earth day. So that's part A. Use the answer for part A to determine the radian measure in one. Okay, so if it goes from here to say here, we want to know what that angle is, okay? Um, well, if we know what S is, we know what S is, right? And we know what R is, all right? We know S and we know R. We want to know what theta is. Well, S equals R theta. So theta is S over R. Here's S, boop. And here's R, boop, all right? So here's S, whatever this number is, which is some huge number. And then R was 36 million miles. Notice the miles go away. This is all just one big number. And we're talking about an angle here. So I'm just gonna write the word radians. Remember radians are dimensionless units, right? If you write this, you interpret that as an angle. If you don't, that's just a number. All right, but they're asking about an angle. So I'll write the word radians for them. And that's it, S equals R theta. Uh, let's look at, try it number eight here. Find the arc length along a circle of radius 10 units. What do they mean by units? I'm going to say meters. They're just leaving it generic, right? You could be feet or centimeters, whatever you want. Let's just use meters to make it more real. Subtended by an angle of 215 degrees. Well, we have S R theta. S is R theta. R is 10 meters. Theta is 215 degrees. We want a length. If somebody asked you, how long is this? And you said it's so many meters degrees, you would look at them like weird, right? We got to get rid of these degrees. We This needs to be in radians. So get rid of degrees. There's pi radians and 180 degrees. There's radians. I'm not even going to write it because if somebody asks you for a length, you don't want to say meters radians, right? You just say meters. So I'm going to throw away the word radians because it's a dimensionless unit. So we have whatever that times that times that is, that's just some number, you can get it out of your calculator, of meters, okay? I don't wanna waste time plugging numbers into calculators, all right? Uh, that was try it number eight. All right, here's the area of a sector of a circle, okay. So they, they just kind of, they kind of explain how they come up with this, uh, this uh, area, but it's a sucky explanation. So I'm gonna derive it for you. All right, this is a sector. It's a piece of pizza, right? Um, I don't know what this area is. Let's figure it out. One thing I do know is that for a whole circle, that's, that's a, that's a sector, it's the whole pizza, right? I know that the area of a circle is pi r squared. I know that. And that's a very specific uh, sector, right? It's a trivial case. There's also this one, the sector of angle zero has an area of zero, but that one's not very useful. So there's two trivial cases, the zero sector and the whole circle sector. That one's useful. Now, one thing I'm gonna say is that the bigger the angle, 
the bigger the area. All right. So the ratio, I want to find the area of a sector. Well, the ratio of a generic sector like this one to the area of a whole circle is the same thing as the ratio of the angle for a generic sector to the angle for the whole circle, all right? So we're comparing uh, proportions, we're setting up proportions between the angles and the areas. So a generic angle with a generic area is gonna be the same as two pi is to the whole circle, okay? So that tells me the area of the sector is theta over two pi times the area of a circle. The area of a circle we know is pi r squared. So we get the area of a sector is theta r squared over two. All right. I'll never remember this. We're going to use it a couple of times and probably forget. If you ever need to use it again, you probably look it up. Or if you're doing a lot of science, these tricks is where a whole lot of formulas and stuff come from. You know a specific case, that's a sector, I know that area, and I throw down a proportion, and then I substitute in, and boom, I have a formula. That's how a whole lot of math formulas are derived. Specific case, proportion, boom, you got a formula, okay? So it's theta r squared over two is the area of a sector. All right, let's look at some examples. These are basically gonna be plug and play, okay? Finding the area of a sector. All right, we have a lawn sprinkler. Uh, it has a radius of 20 feet, uh, rotates 30 degrees. What is 30 degrees in radians? Get rid of degrees. I want uh, pi radians is the same as 180 degrees. So this is pi over six, all right, in radians. That's what our angle is. What is the area of the area of this sector? Well, the area of that sector is theta r squared over two. Theta is pi over six. R is 20 feet over two. So that's a number, number, number. Plug it in your calculator. And when we have feet squared, Okay, how do you do it now? When it comes to formulas and stuff, dimensional analysis is important. This is an area, it has units of length squared. So this has to have units of length squared. If you're trying to think, is it R cubed or just R? It has to be R squared, length squared, right? Circumference, two pi R, length, length. Uh, the area of a circle, pi R squared. Link squared, link squared. Let's see the volume of a circle. Four thirds pi r cubed, I think. Link cubed, link cubed. All right. Uh, the area of a, a, a rectangle, right? Link times width. Link times a link. Link squared. Dimensional analysis. Anytime you're trying to remember a formula, think of the units or dimensions, and that will guide you. Okay. Remember, this is a dimensionless unit. All right, so it has no dimensions. This unit has dimensions length squared. Okay, try it number nine. All right, a central pivot irrigation, a large irrigation pipe on wheels rotates around a center point. A farmer has a pivot system with radius. 400 meters, okay? If water restrictions allow only her to water 150,000 square meters per day. So we have 150,000 square meters per day, right? That's the limit. What angle should she set the system to cover? All right, well, I think they mean here in a day, right, per day. So um, if we, uh, this is an area, right, meters per day. So our area 
per day should be 150,000 liters per day. I, I think this problem is just kind of worded awkwardly, but that's what they mean. 150,000 square meters per day. What angle should you set the system to cover per day? Okay. So uh, our area is 150,000 meters squared. We know the radius. We need the angle. We know that area is theta r squared over two, right? Now, y'all might be tempted to, okay, there's my formula. I'm gonna plug these numbers in and then solve for theta. Well, if you do that, you end up writing these big ass numbers over and over and over again, and that sucks. So what you wanna do, we want theta, solve for theta first and then plug your numbers in. Let's see, I would have theta r squared equals two a, or theta equals 2a over r squared. Now plug your numbers in. We have a 2, 150,000 meters squared over 400 meters squared. Notice meters squared fall out, right? And since this is an angle, I'm going to go ahead and write the word radians. So this is plug it in your calculator, it's some number of radians, okay? So notice I only wrote the numbers once. If you'd have plugged them in here and then solved, you'd have had to write 150,000 and 400 like five times, and that sucks. We don't wanna have to write these huge numbers over and over again. Always try to solve for your variable first, and then at the last minute, plug the numbers in. Then you have an exact answer. Plug it in your calculator, you're gonna have an approximation. Okay. All right. This step is just arithmetic. Y'all can do that. Uh, what was that? I was number nine. Linear and angular speed. Okay. Uh, oops. I don't know. So here's this really long paragraph that's super boring. So I'm going to sum it up. Linear speed, also known as velocity, right? V, this is length per time. We're talking about being on a circle here. So this is an arc length per time. This is a definition. You have to memorize it. You can't derive it. It should be obvious, length per time. Angular speed. All right. We'll say this is, it looks like W, but it's really omega. It's angle per time. All right. This is a definition. Okay. Length per time, angle per time. All right. That's great. What we would like to have though is, can I get a relationship? Can I get a formula that has V and W in it? Like if I know what W is, it'll tell me what V is, or if I know what V is, it'll tell me what W is, All right? We're gonna use the fact that S equals R theta, okay? Um, this thing, so I'm gonna start here and I wanna use both of these to get this. This isn't a definition, all right? These you have to memorize. This you can get from these definitions and this relationship. Let's see how we do it. Um, this guy here tells me that theta is omega t. So I'm gonna start here and I wanna substitute using these. I need to get a B and a W in here. So I'll use this one and to get a W. So I'm gonna replace this in favor of a W or omega. So theta is omega t, so I'm going to replace theta with omega t here, okay? So now I have a relationship between s and omega. Now I want to get a relationship between, oh, I already have a relationship between s and v, okay? So let's see here. Um, how can I do this? Uh, let's see, omega t, if I do... Uh, I 
I need to get V involved. I need to use this. Um, let's see. T would be S over V. No, I want to get R in there. Hold on. I forgot my next step. V, V is S over T. Okay, we're going to use this guy. So we know V by definition is S over T, um, but S is RWT. So replace S with R omega T. We have a T on the bottom, the T's go away and boom. That's what we have, V equals R omega, okay? So we used each one of these, all right? We, we used that, we used this and this, crammed it into that. We just got rid of S, right? Uh, so uh, we could we could have said s is r theta right and then theta is omega t and you have v equals r omega so this is convenient to switch between linear speed and angular speed these are the definitions okay all right so this isn't something you have to memorize it's something you can get from this in two steps, right? But we'll remember it and we'll use it and then we're probably gonna forget about it right after this section. It's not something that's gonna show up all the time in this class, right? But it's something you need to know. It shows up all the time in science. Notice angle per time, right? This guy right here, this is radians, which is dimensionless unit. This has units of per time or a frequency, also known as hertz. Right, so anything that's periodic that happens over and over again, we use that. This is going to show up a whole lot in engineering and all that stuff. Now here's your three and G then. These are definitions. This one is just an equation, a formula. Oh, uh, let's look at this super complicated problem right here. Okay, so uh, the water comes in, makes the wheel turn. The water is going at a linear speed and it makes this thing turn at an angular speed. Now, this thing completes one rotation every five seconds. Find the angular speed in radians per second. Well, angular speed is angle per time. This says it goes one rotation well, one rotation is the same as two pi radians, and it does that every five seconds. And that's it, angle per time. That's its angular speed. All right, number 10. Okay, a vintage Vinyl record is played on a turntable rotating clockwise at a rate of 45 rotations per minute. Find the angular speed. Okay, omega is angle per time. It's doing 45 rotations. A rotation is two pi radians, and it's doing that every minute. Angle per time, that's it. We could write this as 90 pi radians per minute if you want. But that's it. It's an angle per time. I know they said rotations, but a rotation is 2 pi radians as an angle. Okay. How to, there we go, example number 11. Let's see what they want us to do here. Do, do, do. Hey. The bicycle has wheels of 28 inches in diameter. Well, that means the radius is half that or 14 inches, right? Tachometer determines the wheels are rotating at 180 revolutions per minute. Find the speed the bicycle is traveling down the road. Well, 180 revolutions per minute, that means omega is 180 revolutions Per minute, right? I could say radians per minute, okay? That's what omega is. So they've given us R and omega, 
they want us to find v. Well, we know that v is r omega. See, this is the case where if we know r and we know omega, right, we're going to use this. So we could just plug it right on in. So r is 14 inches, and omega here is 180 times 2 pi uh, radians per minute. Here we're looking for length per time. So let's throw away the word radian, right? So this is 14 times 180. So that's just some number of inches per minute. Just plug it in your calculator, right? This is linear speed. It should be length per time, OK? So we don't want to say, you wouldn't say, how fast are you going? You'd be like, I'm going 65 mile radians per hour. Right, you wouldn't throw that word radians in there. Right, throw the word radians out. Look at number eleven. The satellite is rotating around the Earth at 0.25 radians per hour. Omega is 0.25 radians per hour, angle per time at an altitude of 242 kilometers above the Earth. All right, so here's the Earth. This is 242 kilometers. Oh, the radius of the Earth is 6378. OK, so that means this radius here is 242 plus 6378. And uh, I guess I'll use my calculator. I don't screw up my addition here. All right. 242 plus 6378, uh, it's 6,620 kilometers. So I have a radius. I have omega. Find the linear speed in kilometers per hour. V equals R omega. R is 6620 kilometers. And omega is 0.25 radians per hour. Again, I want a linear speed, so I'm going to throw away the word radians. And this gives me whatever that is. It's some number of kilometers per hour. And that's how you do that problem. Uh, and that's the end of section 5.1. Now 5.2, I'm going to do it a lot like I did 5.1. I'm going to give you the rough overview of the whole thing real quick. And then next time, we're going to go through it slowly and in detail. Now, emphasis here on the word function. All right. Y'all are used to functions like this. F of x equals like stuff with the, with the letter x in it, right? That's a function for you, right? Now, in pre-cal, they never show you what sine and cosine are. These are functions, OK? Sine is a function. We would call it sine of x. What is it in terms of x? No other pre calc class will tell you. I'm going to tell you what sine of x is. First, I need to give you some notation, what the word factorial means. Four, in fact, this is not four, OK? This is four factorial. This is four times three times two times one. 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. 2 factorial is just 2 times 1. 1 factorial is just 1. And by definition, 0 factorial is also 1. Factorial just means multiply all the numbers that come before it. OK? And this shows up a lot in math, a whole lot. And you can think of why in statistics. Let's say I have four people, uh, and I want to put them in a line. How many different ways can I put four people in a line? Well, for the first person to put in the line, I have four people to choose from. Now, for the second position in line, I have three people to choose from. Now, for the third person in line, there's only two people left. And for the last person to put in the line, there's only one person left. So there's four factorial different ways you can put four people in a line. OK, so you can see how this would show up a lot in, well, statistics. All right. Now. Using this notation, actually, I want to start off with cosine. Cosine. 
also written as coat. Right? This is not sin. I got students halfway through the semester still talking about sin. All right, this isn't religion class. This is abbreviated sine. This is cosine. They are cofunctions. Cosine looks like this: one minus x squared over two factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial minus x to the sixth over six factorial plus x to the eighth over eight factorial. And this goes on forever and ever and ever. That's why they don't show you this in class. But it is a function. It has an expression. Right? You all don't have the mechanics to know how to add up an infinite number of things yet. You'll learn that in calculus too. All right. One thing I want you to notice is the signs alternate, but all the powers of x are even. This number one here is really x to the 0 over 0 factorial. right? This is just one, okay? Now, um, what can I do with that? One thing I want you to notice here is that since all the x's are even powered, if I replace x with a minus x, all the minuses would cancel out, all right? So that means you could just throw that minus away. This means that this thing is a symmetric function. What that means is that what are the, where the graph is doing over here? It looks exactly the same over there. It's a symmetric function, okay? Whatever happens over here is the same on this side. Again, because a minus to an even power just goes away. So all of them, it, they all just go away. Sign here is x minus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the fifth over five factorial minus x to the seventh over seven factorial plus x to the ninth over nine factorial. And it goes on forever and ever and ever, okay? So y'all aren't used to dealing with stuff like that. It sucks. One thing I want you to know here is that all the x's are to an odd power, all right? So I'm gonna point out that if I replaced x with a negative x, all right, every one of these would give me an extra minus sign in which case I could factor the minus sign out front of the whole thing, All right? So this is what we would call an anti-symmetric function, meaning whatever happens over here, you're gonna get the upside down version over there, okay? So it's, this, this one's even, this dude is called odd or symmetric and anti-symmetric, okay? Now, Check this out. If I want to know what cosine of zero is, oops, not cosine of zero, what is that? Well, if I replace x with zero, well, that goes away, that goes away, that it's just one. I can look at that and I say, okay, that's just one. All right. Now I want you to look at the unit circle, a circle of radius one. If I think of this as being an angle, all right. And remember, you can label your input anything you want. It doesn't have to be called x. I'm going to call it theta. If I think of this as an angle, here is an angle of zero degrees. This coordinate here is one zero. So if I think of the input as an angle, the output happens to be the x uh, coordinate. All right. So let's look at like pi. What if I want to know what cosine of pi is? Well, apparently, according to this, it's going to be one minus pi squared over two factorial plus pi to the fourth over four factorial minus pi to the sixth over six factorial. And what the hell is that? I have no idea what that adds up to, okay? But if I think of this as an angle, here's the angle pi. This coordinate is minus one zero. It just so happens that this adds up to minus one. There's no way in hell you could look at this and say, obviously this adds up to minus one, but it does, okay? And it turns out that cosine, if you think of this input as being an angle and you look at the unit circle, this dude happens to always be the X coordinate on the unit circle. This dude, if you think of this as being an angle, happens to be the Y coordinate on the unit circle. So that's why we need to know our unit circle so that we can evaluate these functions 
easily. And we can only do that for some. We don't know every single point on the unit circle. We're only going to know 16 points, so 16 angles. All right. Now, sine and cosine existed 2,000 years before this did. All right. Where they came from was a triangle. Here's a triangle. I'll call this theta. All right. I'm going to label the sides. I'm going to call this the side adjacent to my angle. This is the side opposite. And then this is my hypotenuse. Hypotenuse. Now, the thing is, is these lengths aren't all that important. You see, this triangle is the same as this triangle. It's just bigger. But the lengths here have different lengths, right? I can make this triangle any size. I can make these links any size. So it's not these links that are really all that important. It's what we can physically measure with a ruler, but it depends on your ruler. Now, what's important though is the ratios. The ratio of this to this is the same as the ratio of this to this, all right, for this angle. Right, so it's really the ratios of any two sides that are important here. Okay, um, now we today we have an x y coordinate system. So we like to do that, and then we would call this point here x y. Okay, that would make my adjacent side the same as x, my opposite side the same as y. And then our hypotenuse would be a radius if we thought about a circle being here. Okay. So y'all know uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, you know, or adjacent squared plus opposite squared equals hypotenuse squared, or x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Well, this is the Pythagorean theorem. This is the equation for a circle of radius r. Well, guess what? A circle is also just a collection of right triangles. It's all the possible right triangles that all have the same radius r, right? Every single one of these right triangles has the same radius. So you can think of, that's the connection between the Pythagorean theorem and the equation for a circle, okay? Now, since it's only the ratios that are important, there's only three sides here, right? If I make the angle, right? If I make this thing bigger, the sides change, but this angle doesn't, it's the same triangle, just bigger. If I change my angle, I have a totally different triangle. So it's really, it's all about this angle here. And again, the angle by definition was the ratio of S to R, the ratio of this to this. So the angle itself is a ratio but it's the angle that defines this triangle, not the lengths of the sides, because you can make the triangle bigger or smaller, okay? So we need to look at ratios. So cosine, which depends on this angle, theta, by definition is the ratio of the adjacent side to the hypotenuse, also known as x over r, right? So it's the ratio of this to this. And we say sine is the opposite side to the hypotenuse, which would be y over r. All right, so the ratio of this side to that side. And there's only one more ratio. We did this one to this one, and we did this one to that one. Well, what about the ratio of that to that? There's only three possible ratios. We call this one tangent. This would be the ratio of the opposite side to the adjacent side, right? this to this. There's only three possibilities, right? This is y over x, right? These are definitions. They have to be memorized. So this is where the ancients came up with these, right? Uh, instead of dealing with x, y, and r, there's only one variable here. Do you want to deal with three variables or just one? Obviously, just one. See, check this out. If I start off with this, the Pythagorean theorem, right? If I divide everything by r squared, right? I end up with x over r squared plus y over r squared. And then r squared over r squared is just one. 
but x over r is cosine. Y over R is just sine. This is the Pythagorean theorem. It's equivalent to that. All I've done is I've scaled it down. This is a circle of radius R. I shrunk it to the unit circle. Look at this. There's only one variable, theta. Do you want to deal with three variables or one? Again, it's the angle that defines everything. The lengths of these sides are totally arbitrary, right? I could draw it bigger, I could draw it smaller. It's the same, same triangle, okay? But now here's the other thing. What if R sucks, right? I don't wanna deal with one half if instead I could just deal with two, it's reciprocal. So yeah, there's only three ratios, but what if these are all fractions? And if I flip them over, they're not. So we have three more. We have secant, which is just one over cosine. So it's R over X instead of X over R. We have cosecant, which is just the reciprocal of sine. So it's uh, R over Y. And then we have the reciprocal of tangent, which we call cotangent, which is just one over tangent. So it'd be X over Y. So these are definitions as well. So there are six trig functions, right? There's really just three and then the reciprocals, okay? And now the thing here is, is look at this tangent here, y over x, that's the same thing as y over r. If I divide the top and the bottom by r, this is just sine over cosine. So if I know sine and cosine, I know tangent, okay? So if I know on the unit circle, right, or an angle, this x, y, so if I'm looking at, this is just cosine, sine. So if I know points on the unit circle, I can evaluate my sine and cosine. If I know my sine and cosine, I already know my tangent because tangent is just the ratio of sine to cosine. And look at all these, these are all just cosines and sine. So we need to know points on the unit circle. So if you ask me, hey, what is cosine of 30 degrees or cosine of pi over six? This is just a number. If I think of it as an angle, right? I can figure out what it is, right? I would say, okay, here's 30 degrees or pi over six. If this is length one, what is this length right here? If I know what that length is, I know what this is. This would happen to be root three over two. How do I know that? How would I guess that? Well, next time we're gonna, I'm gonna show you, again, everything comes down to two triangles. 45 degrees, 45 degrees, length one, x, y, right? Here, they, they happen to be the same. All right, same angles, so these have to be the same. And then there's this dude, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, length one, x, y. This one's easy. We already know that x and y have to be the same, and we know the Pythagorean theorem, right? So uh, x squared, uh, y and x are the same. So this is just x squared plus x squared or 2x squared, or x squared equals a half, or x equals one over root two, which we could rationalize this. If we multiply this by root two over root two, that means root two over two, okay? So that means that if this is in the unit circle, this is just root two over two, root two over two. That tells me that for the unit circle, that angle, that angle, that angle, that angle. I know all of these coordinates. All these numbers are just root two over two. This coordinate, same triangle. The X is negative now though, but the Y is still positive. Over here, the X is negative. Uh, the Y is negative. Over here, same triangle. The X is positive, but the Y is negative. 
great. Now, what about this one? If I figure out what this dude is, if I figure out my X and Y, then I will know the coordinates for this one, 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 and this one. I'll know all those coordinates. So I'll know all my sines and cosines. The tricks to figuring out what X and Y is, all right? Well, of course we know the Pythagorean theorem and how here's the trick to figure it out. Duplicate this triangle. If that's 30 and this is 30, that means that's 60, okay? That makes this guy an equilateral. equilateral. So um, this is still one. If this is y and this is y, this is 2y. Well, if it's equilateral, that means 1, 1, 1. That means 2y has to be 1. This has to be a length 1. So we automatically know that y is 1 half. So if I know the Pythagorean theorem and y equals 1 half, I can plug that dude in. I got x squared uh, is one minus y squared, but y is one half. If I square that, I get a fourth. And that gives me one minus a fourth is three fourths. Square root both sides. That means x is root three over two. y is a half, root three over two. So here's our two triangles that tell us everything we need to know. We got the red one, one, root two over two, root two over two, 45, 45. And then I got this blue one. So this is 30, this is 60, this is one, this is one half, and this is root three over two, root three over two. So there's three numbers going on here. One half, root two over two, and root three over two. These three numbers compose every single point you need to know on the unit circle, other than the simple ones like one zero here, okay? So the middle one goes to the 45, 45, where they're both the same, right? But then it's like, uh, what about this one? One side is small, one side is big. So you just need to remember which one of these numbers is bigger, one half or root three over two. Well, if you're comparing them, they're all divided by two. So which is bigger, one or root three? You might be like, I don't know. It's like, well, one is the same as root one, right? So which is bigger, one or three, right? This is the bigger number. So whenever you're thinking about the 30s and the 60s, just remember there's a small one and a big one, right? So this coordinate right here, the big number, the X, is your root three over two, and then your Y is your one half. And every single one of these is the same two numbers. You just have to remember which one's the little, which one's the big, and plug them in. So this one, the X is the little number, the Y is the bigger number. There's your unit circle. So you'll need to know all the 16 points, all their corresponding angles in degrees and radians. And if you know these points, you know your cosine and your sine. That's your cosine. In this case, it's pi over three. This is your sine of pi over three. So now you can do trigonometry. So now uh, in the next class, we'll finish this section. Now remember y'all, in case you missed it, exam number one is not optional. I was incorrect last time. You need to take it. It opens up Thursday morning, closes Friday night. Um, it's, you can do it at home, online, in WebWorks, all right? The exam retries are optional, okay? But you don't want to have to take the retries. It's a pain in the ass. Remember, you have, to, you have to do corrections on your original exam, take it to the math gym, have them grade it and sign it, and then you upload that. Then you get the permission to take the, the retry. And I think you have to take it in... I forget where it says you take it outside of class. I think you have to be at the math gym to take it. I don't know. There's a long ass paragraph about retries. But so don't miss exam number one. Make sure you take it. It's only sections one, 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 two, one, seven. It's review. Okay. So, all right. Everybody stay warm. All right. And uh, stay safe. All right. Stay off the roads if you can. And I will see you all Friday.
Good luck on your exam if you start it before right class Friday. Okay. All right. Bye, everybody. And I'll, I'll hang out if you have questions here. I'll hang out for a few minutes for you. Okay.